this, uh, this brief series we're doing is on marriage, talking about uh, the lives that uh, God gives us often. Uh, if, if we're in a marriage now, uh, I'm talking to you. If we're waiting for a marriage that will come, I'm talking to you. Yesterday, I got to actually sit at a wedding ceremony, um, which was kind of different for me. I'm, I'm, I'm usually the guy in the front performing the ceremony, but I got to watch Tom uh, stand before uh, a guy named Travis Lowe. He's our teaching pastor. And so Travis uh, got married yesterday. Oh, there they are, yeah. He got married yesterday to his beautiful bride, Mickey, also a member of our staff here at the church. And now uh, they're starting their lives together today. Uh, and, and just how, how fun are weddings? They're just a blast, right? You start to wipe the smile off your face the whole time you're up there. And um, uh, I, I listened as they, they gave their vows to each other. They, they uh, spoke them beautifully. They wrote their own. And, uh, and, and I thought, there it is. That's, that's, that's what a wedding is. It's a promise. Uh, it's a covenant. We're going to talk about that today. It's a, a series of, of vows that are given by a man to a woman and a woman to a man. Uh, that basically set up the rest of their lives together. Uh, we've in this series sought to understand the, the promises that God wants us to make in marriage. Uh, we um, pull them from the actual first mention of marriage in Scripture. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, uh, Moses, as he wrote the first five books of our Bible, uh, wrote this as kind of a commentary on uh, his description of creation, the creation of the male and the female. And he says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. From these verses, uh, we've pulled these vows. Uh, first, the vow of priority, uh, the vow of pursuit, the vow of partnership, and the vow of purity. If you were here last week, we talked about the first two, priority and pursuit. We said in marriage, God is meant to be our one and our spouse is meant to be our two. I grew up believing because of the pop songs I listened to and just the, you know, the common uh, conversations you had with people that we were all looking for the one. Uh, if we could just find the one and marry that person, we'd be happy. Um, I realized as I grew in my faith and understood what you know, life with God is meant to be about, uh, no person spouse or otherwise, could ever or should ever be my one. To, to make someone my ultimate in life is to make them an idol because my one, my chief priority in life is always meant to be my God. Now second to that, I believe for a married person or someone who will be married is uh, the second most important relationship we have in life is with our spouse and nothing should supersede that. Those are the chief priorities of the godly marriage. God is our one. And our spouse is our two. We took that from where it says in Genesis 2, 24, that the man shall leave his father and mother. It's this Hebrew word, hasab. It means to loosen or to relinquish, to leave earthly, earthly priorities behind for the sake of your two. We asked those who were willing, if you were already married or looking to be married someday, to, to take this vow. And many of you said this with me. I vow that God will be my first priority and my spouse will be my second. But we didn't stop there. We talked about how once you have your priorities straight, it's not just enough to, to know what matters, it's, it's on us to pursue what matters, to make the most of um, our relationships with God and with our spouses. And so we understood it this way. We understood that in marriage, I must pursue my two. We, it says in Genesis chapter two that a, a man shall leave his father and mother and will hold fast to his wife. That word hold fast or united in some translations is the Hebrew word debak. And in other verses, it's translated uh, the pursuit uh, of someone so as to catch or something so as to catch it, to pursue hard with affection and devotion, to never stop chasing. And in marriage, that holding fast, that clinging to is, can also be understood as a, as a pursuit. We, we talked about how that's not natural all the time in marriage because as humans, we pretty much are you know, conditioned to pursue what we don't have. We go over the, after the things that we aren't, uh, you know, owning yet. Uh, but in marriage, you know, that deal's done. As soon as we say our vows, I mean, I'm stuck with you, you're stuck with me. Uh, we, uh, as we date each other, we look across the table and we say, ooh. And then we get married and we say, oh. It's because we've lost our passion, our pursuit. We don't understand that it. This relationship is meant to be nurtured. 
We start looking at other things to fulfill us and we start being fond of other people and wondering if we'd be happier with them. Grass might be greener in that situation. I read this last week, I don't know who said it first, but I like it, it's this. When the, the grass looks greener somewhere else, when the grass looks greener somewhere else, it's time to water your own yard. It's time to pursue what God has given you, to nourish it so that it can flourish. So many of you, having uh, listened as we talked about that, made this vow, I vow that I will pursue my two. God is my one, my spouse is my two. In my relationship with her or him, I will pursue and make the most of the relationship that God has given me. Today we want to talk about the last two vows, the vows of partnership and purity. Let me start by talking about how marriage is a partnership. So much of life uh, is uh, is done in tandem, you know, uh, marriage certainly, but in other things too. Like if you get in a boat uh, and there's two of you and both are given a paddle, uh, like uh, Eleanor and I have this kayak, uh, a a double kayak. It's her kayak. Uh, I'd never get in it again if I didn't have to. But, uh, But I love her, and so... Uh, we go kayaking from time to time, and it's, it's a two-man gig, this, this two-man kayak, I mean, by, by its name, obviously, but, but also just even making it work. Like, like uh, if someone's getting in the kayak, the other person needs to be holding it in the back so that they don't fall in, like the, the time where we uh, got in for the first time, and I was the one who fell in. Right by, the wa- right by the outwater's edge, I fall in. Isn't that the worst thing? You're like, honey, just hold it steady. Anyway, uh, but once you get in, there's some certain rules, you know, to making a kayak work. How about both face the same direction? Good start, right? And then when you paddle, paddle in some kind of synchronization. Paddle together. You know, there'll be times where we'll be uh, kind of askew and, and, and Eleanor will start back paddling while I'm forward paddling on the same side because we haven't communicated, right, and we just get farther offline, right? There'll be times where, especially with a kayak, because there's paddles on both sides, right? You got, I mean, you're close enough that if you're going this way on, on, the, on the back side and she's going this way on the front, you're going to smack paddles. You're going to you know, start wrapping knuckles, I can attest, right? And so, so much of success in watercraft of these kinds is linked to being together, being partners. The same can be said of a marriage relationship. And where marriages oftentimes start to separate is over differences. And I believe that partnership happens best when we appreciate and benefit from our differences rather than be divided from them. Isn't that funny? Someone says, uh, or someone once said about you know, relationships often that opposites attract. Has anybody ever heard that? You know, like the two opposite poles of a magnet will be drawn to each other. Opposites attract. That may be true in the dating phase of relationships, but I find the exact opposite to be true once people get married. If, uh, if, if dating uh, causes opposites to attract, I think marriages causes, marriage causes opposites to attack. Right, so like you're dating, and ladies, you look at him and you say, oh, he's so funny, he's so outgoing, he's, so, he's the life of the party. That's how you felt about him before you said, I do. But then a couple years after that, when he never comes home, or he won't shut up when you're out together, you say things like, man, this guy is so obnoxious. What did I ever see in him? Fellas, you marry her, and and before you get married, you you look at her and you say, oh, I'm so grateful I found this woman. She's so organized, she's so prepared, she's so orderly, she's gonna bring this to my life, it's gonna be so great. And two years after you get married, you're like, I have married the worst control freak on the planet! I can't breathe. She won't quit telling me what's wrong in the things that I do. (laughs) It's no wonder, right? Because here's the truth about every marriage, uh, Christian or otherwise, uh, it's comprised of two sinners. People who are, um, you know, subconsciously and a lot of times consciously out for themselves. And so when someone who I'm meant to be partnered with uh, stands in the way of my happiness or the things that I think should be happening, um, I tend to go negative, go dark on those things and accentuate those differences 
um, in a negative way. Our adversary, not just our flesh and our sin, but our adversary loves to come into the things that God has established and ruin them. And so what he loves to do is turn up the volume on your differences and whisper in your ear, can you believe she said that? Can you believe he did that? Yeah, the deck is stacked against us, and that's why it's so important that we understand that and we vow, promise, covenant to make marriage about we and not me. It says in Genesis 2, 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That Hebrew word one is the Hebrew word ichad. It means united or completely joined as one. So, that's, so as to uh, not really notice that they think the things used to be two. Uh, we, and marriage is a mixture, not kind of a, a, a melding or a, a, a grafting. It's a, it's a mixture. You know, like when I, uh, when I make the cookies that are the best cookies in the world, I'm just telling you, but when I make the chocolate chip cookies I make, I put all the stuff in a bowl and I beat that stuff until you can't tell what the flour is and the sugar is and the butter is anymore. It's just cookie dough. Oh, it's so good. I'm going to go make those today. Anyway, uh, but that's marriage. It's a mixture. It's not this kind of, you know, attaching of two people together. It's a blending of two people. I have a shovel in my shed, the handle broke, I'm too cheap to go get another one. And so uh, I've, I've taken this broken handle and I've just kind of duct taped it. <laughs> Can anybody guess how effective that tool is now? <laughs> I can't understand that when I go to dig a hole with it that where the snap is, it just keeps kind of bowing and bending and it's just not effective anymore it's because I need something that's solid, something that's one for it to be effective. Same thing in marriage. Jesus highlighted this idea of oneness as he discussed uh, marriage uh, after being questioned about divorce by some Pharisees that were walking by. It says in Matthew chapter 19, verse three, that the Pharisees came up to him and tested him. They were always trying to catch Jesus in some controversial answer so they could quick, you know, grab their phones and post it on Twitter and, you know, denounce him and have everybody stop following him because he said this about marriage or divorce or whatever. And so they would ask him questions like this one. Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? But Jesus was way too smart for these guys, and so he always answered them in such a way that they couldn't tweet. And he answered them, and he said, and he was always, I love Jesus uh, for all the right reasons, but I love him uh, uh, for the ways that he would sometimes put guys in their place. You know what the best way to put a Pharisee in their, in their place was? Is to ask him if they had read the Bible. Because if you don't know anything about Pharisees, they prided themselves on knowing the law and keeping the law. And so if you want to just kind of poke them, you start your response with these words. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, and he quotes this from Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Haven't you read that? Jesus goes on and he adds his own comments to it. So he says, There's, they're no longer two, but they're one. As it pertains to divorce, it's, it's not supposed to happen. Certainly, he's going to go on in this very text and talk about, except for marital infidelity, I do not permit divorce. But divorce isn't supposed to be a, a topic that we debate. It's just not supposed to happen once marriage begins, except for these very few. Divorce, maybe a as it tells us in 1 Corinthians, a, a, an unbelieving spouse, but it's not a lot after that. It's just not a conversation. The two shall become one. And he says this. These are incredible words. He says, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Who's heard that at a wedding ceremony? Anybody? They usually work that in right at the end. What God has brought together, let no man put asunder. That's how some of the old English puts it. That's a steeped theological statement. It speaks to the sovereignty of God in marriage. Here's what Jesus just said. Marriage is God's idea, his creation, and marriages are brought together by him. 
One of the excuses that I've heard as I've talked with people who want to leave their marriages is at the time that we got married, we weren't both serving God and we probably shouldn't have got married anyway and it probably was against God's will that we did that. And so because I deem it outside of God's will, I am justified in leaving it now. And I can understand some of the reasoning. Certainly there are, you know, more specious circumstances around certain marriages. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen. But what I am saying is that what does happen is on God's watch. And he allows what happens to occur. And so when marriages begin, uh, they begin with God's appointment, a blessing, a a say-so, an allowance, whatever you want to call it. What God brings together is a sovereign thing. Jesus goes on and he says, let no man separate. Let no man separate. That means that... uh, Uh, Marriage is meant to be be this thing that is honored and treasured by everybody, even outside of it. Sometimes uh, two people get married and and members of their family don't like the other person, don't like the choice. Family and friends uh, even sometimes can be like, why'd you marry him? She doesn't fit in with us. And so whether consciously or subconsciously they mean to do this, they do, They, they start speaking in negative terms, and they become a wedge between two people who God has brought together. Uh, If that's you and anybody else's relationship, stop that. You're being used to promote a sin as you encourage your loved one or friend from leaving their marriage. I I talk to weddings at the end of my time as I'm um, preaching at a wedding I address the bride and the groom, right? I tell them what's up. And then I turn to the crowd and I say, so glad you guys are here. I know the best gift you could give to either this Christian woman or this Christian man is your own salvation. If you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ, that'd be the best wedding gift you could ever give them. But listen, beyond that, if you're here, I'm guessing you're here because they know you, like you, trust you, want you to be a part of their lives. And here's how you're gonna do that in this marriage. You're going to be a support to them, an encouragement to them. When they start to have trouble, you're not gonna offer your home as a place to escape. Unless that, can I just say this about marriage? There's lots of yeah buts and what ifs, right? Obviously if a person is being abused, offer your home to them. Does everybody get me? But as a general rule, you wanna be a promoter of that bond and not a part of what would divide it. Is everybody with me? This, Let no man separate obviously applies to anybody who in their foolish mind thinks, you know what, that married person should be married to me. And some of you are like, well, that's just crazy. It's so common these days as people find their past flames on Facebook and other social mediums um, for people to say, oh, I missed out on the one I'm supposed to be with and this one who I am with who doesn't please me and who's so different from me and who is dissatisfying to me. I need to let go of them so I can be with the one I was always meant to be with, even though they're married to someone else. Let's break up two marriages for the sake of ours. Okay, that's adultery. That's sin. And it goes against the very creation and covenant that is marriage. I was listening to Travis and Mickey give their vows to each other and they got to the rings part and Tom said to Travis, Travis, do you have a ring for Mickey? And I never thought of this at this level before, but when we wear these rings, anybody, if you got a marriage ring on, everybody hold it up real quick. Everybody see that? Okay, if you're sitting next to the person who gave that to you, that's their ring. That's not your ring. Ladies, that's not your diamond. That's his diamond. I'm not saying that, (laughs) you don't have to take it off and give it to him. Anyway, but I thought that was such a, uh, I've missed that. I've always thought of your ring as being your ring and my ring as being my ring. No, this is Eleanor's ring. It's a much cheaper ring, but this is Eleanor's ring, right? And and even though the ring is a reminder, reminder to me of my vows and my covenant, it's a reminder to everybody else that I'm not mine. I'm hers. She's not hers. She's mine. Hands off. But here's, here's one of the things that I think that phrase, let no man separate, applies to that maybe we don't think of all the time. 
I think it applies to the people in the marriage. What God has brought together, let not you who married him, let not you who married her be the agent who brings it to separation, who causes it to divide. Let no man outside the marriage, no woman inside the marriage, no, no person come between what God has brought together. It's a covenant. Marriage is a covenant, not a contract. A contract simply protects the involved parties uh, who sign it from the wrongdoing that could happen and might happen, uh, and, and it makes sure that they get what they deserve on the, on the backside. So when you sign you know, the, the car loan, if you don't pay your payments, they can come in the middle of the night and take their car back. If you do pay their payments, they can't come in the middle of the night and take your car back. It's your protection from each other. That's what contracts do. They protect people in the event of things going wrong. Covenants aren't about that. Covenants are based on a mutual commitment that seeks to continue in place regardless of the other person's actions. Except as Jesus said in cases of infidelity and maybe some other things, but, but it persists without respect to what the other person is bringing. A contract is based on mutual distrust. A covenant is based on this mutual commitment. A contract is 50-50, I'll bring a little, you bring a little, let's see what happens. But a covenant and the marriage covenant is 100-100 like the great Saint John legend taught us. I'll bring all of me, you bring all of you. Even when I lose, I'm winning. I don't know the rest of the song. Anyway, uh, I'm sure he was just being mushy, but he was being biblical, biblical because he understood on some level that marriage is not a halfway in transaction. It's all in. It's my everything. We're pretty bad at it as a culture, coin flip. We talked about that last week. I think one of the reasons that we're bad at it, and I want to mention now, is that we as a culture have um, practiced over and over again the act of divorce before we ever get married. And here's what I mean. People enter into relationships before marriage, and they act like they're married even though they're not. They share a house. They share a bed. Uh, they share built. They do everything that married people do. Everything that was meant by God for a marriage covenant, they do that. But then it doesn't work out, or they see someone better, and they end those relationships over and over and over and over again. And then they finally find their two, even if they call them their one. And they enter into that relationship. Well, and it gets hard, just like the other ones did. But what are they conditioned now to do? They've been practicing divorce for years. And so, why would it be any different? in this actual marriage covenant. They've left every fake marriage covenant up until this point. Just leave this one too. We as a culture have become adept experts even at dividing. We usually do it because of our personal dissatisfaction. This just isn't working for me. It's not you, it's me. <laughs> but that's not what we've been called to. We've not been called to allow our feelings or even our ongoing happiness to be the determiner of our covenant relationship. Like, like it doesn't even make sense. Like, think about that. If a mother says, you know what, I don't feel like what you feed my kids today. We put her in jail. Like, she can't feel like not taking care of her kids and stay in our society free, right? Everybody call your bosses tomorrow and say, you know what, I want to keep getting paid, but I don't feel like working this week. See what they say. Well, Terry, that's interesting. You don't feel like working? I don't feel like paying you. How about that? <laughs> April's coming around. Hey, U.S. government, I don't feel like paying my taxes. Try that for a couple years, see how that goes. <laughs> Wesley Snipes and others can talk to you about that. Now, we don't get to run life on our feelings. We don't get to run life based on our satisfactions. Life has responsibilities. Marriage is one of them. When we covenant, we say regardless, better or worse, richer for poor, sickness and in health. I'm in this till death do us part. Hmm. The scriptures teach us 
uh, this partnership idea in Ephesians chapter 5. It goes on in subsequent verses after this one to talk to us about the husband's role as, a, as, a, as, as being like Christ to his wife, as dying for the, for the church, uh, or as Christ died for the church, we should die for our wives. Uh, uh, the, the wives are meant to submit to their husbands as an act of worship, as, a, as an honor to each other. There's meant to be this, this, this self-sacrifice for the sake of us being one. But it's all couched in this one verse, Ephesians 5.21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Regardless of your personality, usually there's a, a more dominant person in a relationship, a more outgoing person in a relationship, and then maybe a more passive or less outgoing person. If you're, if you're kind of a dominant personality or a more outgoing person, would you be willing to put your hand up? Most of you are. Go ahead, put it up in the air like you just don't care. Some of you are like, dang straight, Mark, that's me. Some of you, though, are more passive. If you're a more passive person, would you put your hand? These are usually slower. Some of you are turning to your spouse right now. Am I passive? If you're asking if you're passive, you're passive, just so you know. It's just automatic. But regardless of, of where you're from, how you were raised, what your personality is, what your gifts and talents are, there is meant to be in your relationship this melding of the two of you in mutual submission, loving each other for the sake of each other and for the glory of God. My hope today is that as we move on from our time together, if you're already married, you'll make this promise with me, that you'll vow to make your marriage about we and not me. Well, let me talk finally and briefly about this vow of purity that rounds out the four vows we've been discussing in this series. Vow of purity. One more time with some audience participation, if you would. Uh, if you're married in here, uh, for the most part, are you satisfied and grateful to God for the fact that you are married? If you can do that, put your hands up in the air. Lots of elbows flying right now. You better get that up there, pal. Okay, put them down. Okay, if you're not married yet, but you look forward someday to being in a marriage, you can put it down, Glenn, serious. I know you're happy about being married. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> but if you aren't married, and you look forward someday to being married by the grace of God, and that's your desire, could you just raise your hand real quick? Just put that up there. Okay, hold them up for just one more time. Just everybody look around. Does everybody see who's not married? Okay, good. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, that doesn't surprise me, you know, that uh, these graces, these um, marriages we've been given or might be given are things that we would be, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm for, I'm, I'm all about that. Let me ask you a couple other questions. How many of you sitting here today are looking forward to the day when you finally get to commit adultery? Would anybody put their hand up for that? I, I look forward to the day where I get to commit adultery. Still haven't had anybody in any of the services put their hand up for that one. How about fellas, how about this one? I can't wait to get home and continue my life-controlling addiction to pornography. Would you put your hand up if that's you today? Like, I can't wait for church to get over so I can log on and just ruin my life with porn. Anybody? Anybody getting uncomfortable? Ladies, let me ask you this, fellas too, but who, who is looking forward to the day when you can finally find that person from high school that you wished you'd married and you can start that emotional affair on Facebook with them? Who's looking forward to that day? Anybody looking forward? Uh, what a, what a well-trained church you are. Well done. No one put their hands up for those. Those are sin, Mark. I know. I'm not supposed to say yes to that, right? Okay, could someone answer me this then? No one in here looking forward to any of that. Why does that happen? All of those things. Why do all of those things happen so often in Christian marriage? Why do people on the regular step out on their relationships with each other, with other people? Thank you, I'll do the preaching, but you're right. <laughs> she said selfishness. She's skipping ahead for me, that's good. I'll tell you why anybody sins. It's because it is the plague of humanity. And by the grace of God, we can overcome. Everybody agree, we don't have to sin. We've been called to a life free from sin, but so often we are prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, right? We just head into stuff that we never thought we would head into. You know what, you know what freaks me out more and more as I do this longer is that the marriages that I never thought this would happen to are the marriages it happens to. Has anybody ever seen that? 
Like some of you guys, I don't know how you've stayed married. God bless you that you have, right? <laughs> but God gives grace to these marriages that struggle all the time. And then there's these, some marriages you're like, how, where, when, why? And it's because we're all sinners and no one is exempt. That's why I think this priority is probably a little bit more important even than the other three. In fact, I, I believe if you can't get this priority straight, the other three will be impossible. Because this priority, this, this vow, I should say, of, of purity feeds the other three. Like if I can't be committed to doing marriage in the right and in the light, that's the last vow, I vow to do marriage in the right and in the light. If I can't commit to doing life in general according to the precepts that are given to me in scripture, if I can't understand what God wants for me and then execute it in my life, then I am going to struggle with keeping him as my one and my spouse as my two. I'm going to wrestle with pursuing the one who is meant to be the most important in my earthly life. I'm going to always uh, seek to honor me ahead of the we in my relationship. This is what sin does to us. That's why Jesus in so many ways, at so many times, tells us to build our house on the rock, on the truth of his word, so that when the storms come, our house stands. Don't build your house on the lies that the world gives, because when the storms come, your house falls. Be pure, be right, live according to the things that I have taught you. Be honest. That's what it means in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, where it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And it says the man and his wife in this first relationship were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Moses describes marriage. He says this is the goal of marriage. It was easy at this time for Adam and Eve to do that because sin didn't exist yet. You've got to turn the page in Genesis for sin to come into the world, but in chapter 2, it's not there. And so, of course, there's nothing to, to divide them as husband and wife. There's no shame. But when sin comes in, watch these same people who are described in chapter 2 as being naked and not ashamed become completely wrapped with shame to the point that they're sewing fig leaves into aprons and covering up their nakedness to the point where they're hiding from their God like that's possible because of the things that they've chosen and defying him. That's what sin does. It causes us to cover up. It causes us to hide. It leads us deeper into wrong and away from right. It, it takes us further into darkness and away from God's light. God's desire for us is to choose in all of life, but especially, all of life, but especially in my marriage or in the marriage that awaits me, God wants us to be pure. He knows that our purity, our willingness to obey him and honor him with what he's given us, it will set us up for the successes and the challenges that await us in our marriages. I've been telling this story all weekend. Uh, I think it pertains to what I'm saying. I'll close with it. I, I, I love going to movies and uh, I stand in line for my $40 popcorn and soda and uh, but then I get it and I walk from this brightly lit hallway into the dark theater. And those first few moments are kind of, okay, I'm in G11. I can't see any letters, let alone any numbers on seats, right? So I'm just gonna start walking until eventually, as my eyes get used to the dark, I'll be able to see where I'm supposed to go. And then I sit down and I you know, talk with whoever I'm there at the movies with and my eyes become accustomed to the darkness. It's easier to watch the movie from there, right? The dark room, that's why they did the lights. I think what happens in our lives is that uh, we go from services like this or from our life groups or our own personal times of study and we're, we're very much in the hallway, we're very much in the light. But then temptation comes and it leads us into these dark rooms of secrecy and sin and, and all of a sudden we're there and, and initially we're, we know we're not supposed to be here. It's hard to see in here. But we stay long enough that we get used to the dark. We just kind of inhabit that space and we're like comfortable there. Our spouse doesn't know, our friends don't know, our pastors don't know, no one knows, but I know. But I'm cool, I'm in the dark. 
And over and over in scripture, you see that God is trying to take us from darkness to light, from what we've gotten used to to what we're really meant for. And he wants to do that in your life today. He wants to do that in your marriage. He wants to do that in your own personal life. If you don't know Jesus or you've been off the rails and kind of living life without Jesus, he wants you to come back to what's right and what's in the light today. Now here's how that works. You gotta leave the dark. The Bible describes it as repentance. You've been going this way, repentance means turn and go the other way. You've been living in the dark, repentance means come out of the dark and live in the light of God's truth. For some of us, that's, well for all of us, that requires confession to our God and to those that we're wronging. It requires uh, commitment to not just say, I'm gonna move the other way, I really mean it. It means really going the other way. And I'll tell you, when I walk out of the movie theaters, usually I, I don't make it through movies anymore because I've drank the 68 ounces of soda, right? And so I've gotta to run to the bathroom halfway through. And, uh, and so I walk out from this very dark theater into the bright lights of the hallway again. Isn't that a jarring moment, right? Like some of you walk out of this room after a service and start, go out those side doors to go get your kids and you're in the, the white death, I call that patio over there. It's like, ah, right? You just, your eyes, pupils shut and all that stuff. And that, that's how it'll feel today if you decide uh, as God is leading you to leave the dark that you're so used to, it'll feel kind of jarring. It'll feel like maybe you want to go back in there. But just let your eyes adjust. Just let your life adjust to living in the light, to living in the right, and see what God does as you do. Proverbs tells us this. In 28, 13, it says, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. If you can stand today, everybody stand with me as we close. Here's my heart for all of you. In general, I want us all in here, regardless of whether we're married or whoever get married or whatever, I want us all to live what's right and what's in the light. And I encourage you today, if you're not, if you don't even know um, what those things might be to talk to someone, talk to me or one of our other pastors or a prayer partner and just start figuring out the things um, that aren't right and aren't in the light, the things that could be dragging your marriage down, the things that could be dragging your life down. Confess those, repent of those and walk in the light. But when it comes to marriage or the marriage that awaits you, there's these vows that we need to take, this covenant that we need to make. And if you could say these vows with me, and mean them, say them, and then go live them. You ready? If you believe this, say it. I vow that God will be my first priority and my spouse will be my second. Say them after me, ready? I vow, secondly, I vow that I will pursue my two. I vow to make my marriage about we and not me. And then I vow to do marriage in the right and in the light. Let's pray. God, we thank you uh, for the blessings that you give us in life. You, you, you give us, uh, even in our sin, a chance to be forgiven through our faith in Jesus Christ. Um, you've done the work that we could never accomplish And we have but to accept by faith what Jesus has done to be restored and reconciled to you. Thank you so much for that. But the blessings don't stop there. You give us um, these earthly relationships, friendship and family. You give us marriage. Um, it's this picture of how your son uh, relates to us as, as his church. It's this, it's this incredible grace. Yeah, but it can become um, difficult and challenging and, and we can want to walk away from the covenant that we've made with you. I pray, God, that we would renew our strength in you and we would walk forward in our marriages um, confident of you in us, helping us keep these vows that we've made today. Uh, Lord, um, if, if there's things that need to be repented of, I pray that car rides home are 
Um, not just snapping on the radio and moving on to what's next. I, I pray that uh, soon, after I say amen and we stop singing the song that's gonna close our service, uh, that the marriage is represented here would um, connect, come into the light, and seek what's right uh, for your glory and for their own sake. I pray that you would, as I uh, saw my high school friends sitting over here and others in around the room that are you know, on this side of marriage, I pray that you would um, secure them to yourself in such a way that they would never venture into what the world's ideas um, would, would bring them to and, and, and that they would never settle for anything less than your very best in their relationship. So that having you as their one, when they finally connect with their two, they would be set, prepared uh, to keep the covenant that you have brought them into. We love you, Lord. We are grateful today. We sing your praises. Uh, you're, you're devoted to us. You bring us into uh, relationships where we can be devoted to each other. Um, your praise will ever be on our lips. And we sing this song in response to you today.